In the name of Mr. Polyev, confidence in the Prime Minister and the government. Mr. Polyev, seconded by Mr. Nader, moves that the House has no confidence in the Prime Minister and the government. Mr. Polyev, appuyé par Mr. Mr. Polyev, seconded by Mr. Nader, moves that the House has no confidence in the Prime Minister and the government. Member from Carlton, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Madam Speaker, this country made me a promise when I was born. It made the same promise to everyone in this room and across this country. I was uh, born to a 16-year-old single mom who put me up for adoption. The two school teachers, and they taught me about this promise. The promise was that anyone from anywhere could do anything. That hard work would earn a powerful paycheck. They would buy you good food and a decent home in a safe neighborhood. It's that promise that brought my wife's family here as refugees from Venezuela. Six people in a two-bedroom basement, working-class Montreal apartment. Her dad up at the crack of dawn to hop on the back of a pickup truck and go out into a, the middle of a farm field and pick fruit so that he could pay the rent. Today, her brothers are a soldier, a carpenter. Her sister is a nurse. Her father has uh, a business with his, his wife, and they have all succeeded. The promise was kept. It was that promise that got me into politics in the first place, and I was very proud to be part of a government that not only kept the promise but expanded it. With the lowest inflation in almost half a century, incomes after tax and inflation that went up 10%, we cut the GST, we balanced the budget. We did it all by, while increasing health care transfers faster than any government yeah, exactly. since that transfer. <laughs> I welcome every single time I talk, they talk about my experience in government is doing the exact same things that I would like to do in the future, which is to expand the opportunity, expand the promise of this country. But that promise, after nine years of the NDP Liberal Prime Minister, is broken. Everything costs more, with two million people lined up at food banks because they cannot afford food. This is a record-smashing number. Ten, one in ten Torontonians now eat at a food bank every single month. Housing costs have doubled so that two-thirds of young people believe they will never be able to afford a home. That has never happened in Canadian history. And we see it most tragically in our streets where there are now 1,800 homeless encampments across Canada, uh, sorry, across Ontario, 35 in Halifax, quaint, beautiful, once prosperous Halifax has 35 homeless encampments. The Prime Minister admits in his own press releases one in four kids are not getting enough food. Malnutrition and diseases linked to it that had long ago been eradicated are making comebacks. We've lost 47,000 people to drug overdoses more than we lost in the Second World War. These numbers are stories. They are human lives. When the NDP says, all these people can just wait. We don't need to fix these problems now. We could just delay another year and let thousands more die, thousands more lose their homes and move into dangerous tent encampments. Thousands more become addicted to government-funded drugs or be killed by a rampant career criminal released once again for the 76th time to unleash chaos in our streets. They say wait to those Canadians who are suffering the pain of a brutal economy, the worst economy since the Great Depression. The per capita GDP, that's income per person, is down more than at any time since the Great Depression. In fact, our economy per capita is smaller today than it was, was 10 years ago. Our income per person has dropped more than any other G7 country since 2019, the year before the pandemic, while the American economy has grown 19 percent. 
right next door. The gap between our per capita GDP and the Americans is now worse than at any time since at least World War II and according to one liberal economist, Trevor Tom, the worst in a century. We've gone from winning the war of capitalism with the Americans, the tug of war, where they were investing 30 to 100 billion more per year in our economy than we were investing in theirs in the first 14 years of this century, to in the last nine years, 450 billion more Canadian money invested in the States than the reverse. Canadian dollars building pipelines, mines, business centers, shopping centers, and businesses that pay American paychecks. I love America, but I don't want to bring jobs to Americans. I want to bring home those jobs and the Canadian promise to this country. And that's why we have a common sense plan to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget, and stop the crime. Axe the tax. This will be a carbon tax referendum, a carbon tax election. And I know that the media has worked hard to try and avoid me saying the words carbon tax, as we saw in the extremely dishonest and fraudulent report from Bell Media Controlled CTV, uh, who is uh, a company that is, whose, whose bonds have been downgraded to near junk status as its overpaid CEO empties the books to pay his wealthy friends an unacceptably and unrealistically high dividend. But I am the reason why he and his other cronies at that company are going after me is because he knows that I'm standing up for the people against the crony capitalists and insiders like him. Carbon tax election. Here's the, here's the existential choice. Do we go to a 61 cent a liter carbon tax making us among the highest taxed fuel in all of the world? A tax that will grind our economy to a halt, that will force our truckers to leave to the U.S. where there is no carbon tax. Nobody left to bring goods to our grocery store, parts to our factories, jobs to our people. It will be a nuclear winter if this happens. That's why common sense conservatives will ax the tax. We will bring home jobs, paychecks, businesses, and opportunity with abundant, affordable energy. We will fight climate change and protect our economy with technology, not taxes, by approving large-scale green projects that generate nuclear, hydroelectric, carbon capture and storage, and other sources of affordable, clean Canadian energy. We'll once again get approved when we repeal the anti-development law C-69, all of which will generate the revenues so that we can fix the budget. fix the budget by unleashing massive growth through the elimination of bureaucratic barriers and firing gatekeepers so that our projects can get built, setting the goal that all three levels of government should aspire to have the fastest building permits in the entire OECD. After nine years of tax increases on entrepreneurs and calling businesses tax cheats, we will pass a bring it home tax cut to lower t the burden on work savings and investment so that we bring home powerful paychecks and production to this country. Lower, fairer, simpler taxes. We will cap government spending with a dollar-for-dollar dollar law that requires we find one dollar of savings for every new dollar of spending. We'll cut bureaucracy, waste, and consulting contracts so that we can get the, the budget close to or hopefully on balance as soon as possible to bring down interest rates, inflation, and debt. And finally, we will unleash the construction of homes by incentivizing municipalities to grant faster permits, free up land, and speed up uh, and to cut development taxes so that we can build, build, build in safe neighborhoods with jail, not bail, for repeat violent offenders to bring home the promise of Canada of a powerful paycheck that earns affordable food, gas, and homes in safe neighborhoods where anyone from anywhere can do anything the biggest and most open land of opportunity the world has ever seen. That is our vision. That is our purpose. Now, let's bring it home. Yeah.